Sorry, Zach, meant to mute you. <laughs> Thank you for muting yourself. Good Friday morning to you. It is flashback, flash forward Friday. I'm excited to uh, go ahead and bring a discussion that we've been talking about this entire week to a close. Uh, that, of course, that is the discussion that I had with Sean Griffin uh, last Friday. And uh, so if there's your flashback. Uh, today, we're going to get to complete that discussion, that review, if you will, and provide some flash forward uh, regarding the goals for this program and many other resources regarding the power of preterism. Edward, good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to move in on our program. I hope you are as excited as I am. And uh, with that said, I'll uh, pass it over to you, ask you to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself as you will, and then lead us in a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Sure. My name is Edward Howell, and I and I was privileged to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church. And uh, now I'd like to open this up in prayer. Heavenly Father, give us clarity. Um, go before us. Um, open our eyes, ears, and minds that we may receive that which will be uh, spoken of today. And hopefully it will provoke conversation that we may you know, open up dialogue and speak with one another on these matters. You know, that we may grow and uh, possess and increase in the things of God, that we may be fruitful and effective in the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Great prayer. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I hope you are as excited as I am to just kind of wrap this up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I appreciate your time and your diligence in joining with me here to do this. So, um, and, and again, I don't want to overexhaust the topic, you know, so, uh, if I may just cover us in review and then bring up some things and, and bring us right in on the program. So we've, uh, we've went through post review, post discussion thoughts. And obviously many of us shared a bit of frustration about uh, the dialogue, the outline, um, maybe some of the topics that were brought up that needed to be further exhausted. Um, and then we moved into talking about the hermeneutical differences, you know, the interpretational differences between Sean and I. And uh, two of the things that we had highlighted was our understanding of spiritual and also things above. And uh, I provided a bit of a definition from my understanding, uh, ultimately, ultimately pointing people to my resource, my book, Wicked, that I published, uh, where I get into those type of things. And Edward, you were a part of that study. So um, I pointed people to that. And then as far as things above, we had a bit of dialogue a couple of times on the, the Power Hour here. And we... Uh, I, I marked out Bible verses that I listed there on the blog. Again, there's a running resource for this discussion on the Power of Preterism WordPress site. Uh, if you go over there, I have all the links that we've talked about, the verses that we've brought up, uh, all of that listed there. And I'll mention a little bit more uh, in review and, and about that blog as we go through uh, the program today. So that being said, uh, we, we talked about those hermeneutical differences uh, and other hermeneutical differences, and we'll mark out plenty today. Uh, and then we talked about texts that were brought up during the dialogue. And uh, I believe we, uh, we reviewed them well. We mentioned quite a few different resources in those different areas. And even some of those areas we've we mentioned that we're gonna work toward hosting Preterist Power Hour sessions, reviewing those things. So uh, again, all of this is gonna be listed on that blog, uh, even the verses. So we'll have the verses listed with the resources that we brought up. And uh, even today, as we lean in on the topics, uh, of specific disagreement uh, will provide links and resources for study in that regard. So uh, one last thing I'll say in review, uh, yesterday we mentioned resources from Larry Siegel. Uh, many of you might remember uh, he was watching the program. I was very appreciative of him being uh, on our live session there on Facebook. A quick shout out to those of you that are watching through Facebook Live. And um, I was appreciative of that. So that being said, I had mentioned him maybe even, jo even joining us or uh, his resources that he had provided regarding the process of redemption, the process of salvation, if you will, the process of glorification. So uh, I had done a little bit of research just in case he wasn't able to join us and he didn't express that he was able to. So uh, what I had done was did a bit of research and I realized that we posted some articles from him in that regard on the Power of Preterism WordPress a couple of years ago, matter of fact, in 2020. So uh, I encourage people to uh, visit that blog I've already mentioned, and I'll have two links, one regarding resurrection, God's purpose of the ages, and then accomplished salvation and God's purpose of the ages. 
Uh, so again, two great articles uh, by Larry Siegel that you can find at the Power of Preterism uh, blog site. So I read this quote this morning, Edward, that I, I shared on social media a couple of years ago. It's by Dr. E. Robinson. I believe Dr. E. Robinson is the uh, 19th century uh, writer uh, that, that did a little bit of research, seemed as though he comes from the Reformed perspective. And he said this, only let the language of scripture be treated with common fairness and interpreted by the principles of grammar and common sense. And much obscurity and misapprehension will be removed. And the very form and substance of the truth will come forth to view. I happen to agree with that. I believe, again, uh, if we were highlighting things, we would highlight common fairness. You know, again, uh, understanding the way that, that we think. You know, we know that the ancients were not as informed about certain things as we would understand today. You know, there's a common fairness with the evolution of knowledge, if you will. Uh, and then um, we know that there are principles of grammar and common sense when reading things, we've talked a bit about that, about understanding prose, uh, you know, understanding literature and the way that it was written, uh, you know, and, and leaning in on that. Uh, and then much, it says here, of much obscurity and misapprehension will be removed if we do those things. And I happen yeah. to agree with that. And uh, that being said, uh, one resource that I'm going to share on our Power of Preterism site uh, on this review for this discussion is an article by Dr. Michael Heiser called uh, on uh, talking about divine accommodation. Now, again, I owe this to Sean Griffin, that Sean Griffin helped me understand this, this phrase, divine accommodation. And I happen to agree. He said he disagrees with it. I happen to agree with it. Uh, Michael Heiser explains it in contrast to Wayne Grudem's uh, thoughts in systematic theology. So I encourage everyone to visit that article, read through those thoughts. And basically, divine accommodation, Edward, is attributed to what we often say here at Blue Point, where we say, uh, you know, God speaks to people in ways they understand. So, you know, I don't believe that God was really leaning in on the discussion about the creation of physical planet and the nature of the physical planet with these people 10,000 years ago. So I believe that he was teaching them truth about himself, his communion with them, if you will, his relationship with them, his covenant with them, and in doing that, he was using language and understandings of their time to illustrate his truth, just as much as he did in the first century, just as much as he does today uh, through the word of God. So that's what I find um, is, is very important, like you had described a little earlier, you know, uh, when you first uh, opened up, is that um, the audience relevance as far as... Um, God speaking to people in ways that they understand, uh, you have to kind of go back and see what was happening during that culture to whereas uh, the language that was being spoken, was it, you know, was it uh, apocalyptic? Was it um, uh, uh, poetic? Was it, you know, whatever it was, you know, whatever form in which it was being spoken, was it plain and direct for those people that would understand it in their uh, way of speaking, you know, um, it's very important to know the language, you mm -hmm. know, and to compare it with other language, you know, throughout scripture, you know, if, if it applies. Right, yeah. well, well, well said. And, and I think another important thing to note from the dialogue I had with Sean was that it's not just about ripping a word out and defining the word. You know, we have to understand not only the context of the literature, but as you're rightly noting there, we have to kind of do more research on how that word might have been used within that culture. And, uh, you know, so that's important. And the unfortunate part is I noticed that some people in review of the di uh, discussion, they had this understanding of, well, this pastor is making things more confusing by encouraging research. Whereas they feel as though they, you know, we should just be able to define the word according to our common understanding. That's a very problematic way of looking at things. Uh, Lazy as well. Yeah. Well, amen. <laughs> That's right. Call it what it is, right, brother? <laughs> Call it what it is. Um, you know, but again, uh, that is a strange way of looking at it because what we're saying, I'm not saying we're making it confusing. What I'm saying is God made it simple to those people as well. Otherwise, if God's making it simple to us, that means that he made it so, so confusing to them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so my point would be, no, God makes it simple, but in within that simplicity, require it requires, you know, doing a little bit of legwork, understanding that we're 2000 years removed from any writing that we find in the Bible. If, you know, and obviously much more, but at least 2000 years removed. So that being said, I actually, uh, I'm going to share another article. I wrote an article in 2014 on how do we literally understand the scriptures? And obviously we talked about that here on the program where, you know, there's that, I gave that threefold understanding there that there's this, you know, ultra hyper literalistic way of reading. If Jesus says he's a door, he's a door, a literal door. If Jesus said he's a, you, you know, um, what else did Jesus compare himself to? Let's, let's find another analogy. A lamb. I'm sorry? A lamb, the lamb of God. Lamb. That's right. Amen. So if Jesus, if the Bible says Jesus is a lamb, he is a lamb. Uh, well, again, we know that would be used in the context of him being the sacrifice, which I Amen. do believe that. But again, I don't believe he was literally a lamb. Uh, however, you know, again, we could go on and on. And I, that view is a misunderstood, very horrible way of understanding the scriptures. So then I would offer up the literal way to read things is to understand, again, as we just marked out, audience relevance, uh, you know, uh, what cultural background uh, and different details. And then, of course, there are those that make everything an allegory, which I continue to teach against. Uh, however, I will say this, the rabbis, Edward, I know you've been leaning in on some rabbinical literature as well. Uh, the rabbis were very comfortable and all, still currently up to this day, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is a mm -hmm. rabbi that's often brought up by Elder Steve Hernandez. And um, Rab uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he's very comfortable with using the imagery of the scriptures in allegorical ways. Uh, and again, we see a lot of preachers doing this in common day. And sometimes it frustrates us because we feel as though maybe the foundation wasn't laid right. So then it's hard to use the allegory if you didn't truly paint the picture. You know, that's yeah. like somebody creating a false picture of you and then somebody else copying the false picture. You'd be frustrated with, because you'd say, well, no, the first picture is wrong. Yes. You know, so if we're going to use the scriptures as a picture to create, you know, understanding of god today we have to make sure we're getting the picture right in the first place just like when i have mentioned uh jesus christ being described as the lamb and mm -hmm. and you have mentioned that he, he's the sacrificial lamb in that regard it's like it's like when he used the word lamb right you would have to go back to it's like going back to uh the old testament kind of to get the definition of certain things because being that sacrificial lamb, uh, okay, lamb doesn't mean the actual, well, it means that how the animal has been sacrificed, you know, but Jesus being the lamb, he's being that sacrificial right. part, you know what I'm trying, where I'm going, right? I know what you're saying. You have to catch the imagery. You have to know the imagery yes. of what the Old Testament is talking about. You know, for example, uh, and I'll make one last point in this and then I'll move us a bit further, but, uh, I'll say you've heard my testimony and you know that I had a problem with what people often do with uh, Jesus dying for your sins. Yes. Now, for me, that was a problem. I, I, I wasn't raised in this. I was actually, let's say, maybe I, I hate to use this phrase, but brainwashed against the idea that if somebody does a favor for you that you did not ask for, that it's not a favor. So, uh, you know, I had this very strong minded understanding that I've much more mellowed out from now. Uh, however, uh, being that I had that mindset, I could not understand this concept that Jesus died for my sins being a good thing because I didn't ask him to. And I didn't understand the Christian evangelist that would sort of uh, try to create an emotion I, in my understanding, you know, uh, out of saying that to me because I didn't understand the context of why somebody needed to die for my sins, why God even created a plan where an animal needed to be sacrificed or something needed to be sacrificed. I, I just could not understand. And what it required was helping me understand the Old Testament and how God revealed himself to Israel and how Jesus was coming to fulfill those things. And that created so much clarity for me and helped me really grapple with what I believed about Jesus. So, you know, again, as you're rightly pointing out, Edward, uh, it's so important to, you know, really understand from the Old Testament the things that we're speaking about in the New Testament. However, as I marked out during the dialogue with Sean, what we should not do is that once we have the clarity in the New Testament, we should not be going backwards and trying to define those things according to the Old Testament. That was one of the points I brought up in the Old Testament. Now, he tried to say I was doing that with the coming of the Lord. That's not what I'm doing. 
what I'm showing you is that the coming of the Lord was previously understood as war or as judgment, as Amen. nations coming against nations. The coming of the Son of Man in the glory of the Father, my point was, was that Jesus is going to, whatever coming and judgment he's talking about is going to be done in the same way the Old Testament is talking about it. But now, of course, it's going to be redefined according to Jesus's judgment. Then we need to ask ourselves, how was Jesus going to come? And that's why we went over to Acts chapter one, uh, the coming of Jesus, which again, we'll talk about here in a moment as we go through some differences. So, so let me let me share something. Do, do I have clarity in this regard? I believe I do. As far as, okay. Um, the Old Testament does not be, does not define the New Testament because the Old Testament is concealed of the New Testament. So the New Testament will define the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you would, uh, it gives you, it gives you the imagery, but the imagery is explained and clarified in the New Testament. That's right. That's right. You're, you're actually uh, saying a popular phrase. I believe it was St. Augustine. He had said, you know, the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed the yes. New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Amen. Right? So, uh, so again, yes, amen. And then that's, that's the way that we should be understanding our Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, again, is it, we, we need to go back to the old, but what we need to be careful of is that now that Jesus provided a spiritual understanding of the judgment, of his coming, of his kingdom, uh, of the tabernacle of God, of the new Jerusalem, uh, and he provided that to the apostles and prophets, which Peter says, right? Peter says in... Um, if I may read it to you, uh, sec, First Peter chapter one, and I know Vicky appreciates me bringing up this text because we talk about this a lot. Here it says in verse, uh, this is First Peter chapter one, verse ten, concerning this salvation. Now again, Peter up till this point is talking about the salvation of the Lord. First uh, Peter chapter one, verse ten, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of this grace that was coming to you searched intently. And with greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. That's what we're talking about here, the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, who? The people that Peter's writing to here. Mm -hmm. When they spoke of the things which have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you, who? The apostles by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. So Peter's telling us that the apostles were given a wisdom that the prophets only knew pointed to the time of the apostles. Again, the prophets knew when they were uttering these prophecies that many of the promises were not for them, but that they were for a time far off, right? Daniel, what is Daniel told? Seal up the book for this is not a time far off. He knows some things, but he doesn't know when they're going to happen. He only knows that there's a beast, a beast, a beast. History will fill in the blanks. Christ's time, the first century, fills in the blanks. The fullness of time, as we marked out yesterday. Question. Does the future believe that the prophecy that Daniel said that to seal up the book, do they still believe that it's sealed? Or do they believe that it's, the seal has been broken? Because Jesus, because Jesus is the one according to in revelation where it speaks about you know there, there was no one found that could open the seal and i and, and i cried or something like that and and then they said you know the the lamb slain before the foundation of the world or something like that or speaking of jesus christ that he was the one that was able that, that was worthy to open his seal which he had done you know so that happened in, in the uh revelation of jesus christ you know right. so that's right you're well noted so uh, again, good question, by the way. Uh, you, you marked it out correctly. Now, again, some futurists do agree uh, that, you know, some futurists go even as far as saying that Matthew 24, uh, obviously, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel, uh, they believe that's occurred. So uh, it depends what futurists you're speaking about. Now, what I will say is there are some futurists. Obviously, these are more of the far out kind. I hate to use that phrase, but it's the truth uh, that believe that, uh, that it's that far out that no. Nothing in Revelation has happened yet. Nothing up until the rapture. 
Uh, you know, so uh, again, there's some strange views in that regard. Uh, many people believe that when John says in Revelation 4, come up here, that's the beginning of the rapture and everything following is, is what follows. So, you know, again, it's, it's confusing. And then there's obviously rapture believers that would believe in uh, recapitulation where the book is not necessarily in chronological order, but they pick and choose how that works. So, you know, again, good question. And, uh, you know, again, we, we see that the time statement for Daniel uh, really only gives it a certain amount of time. Uh, if you believe that Jesus Christ is he who was the one that was able to open the seals, as Edward just rightly noted. Um, that, you know, again, so uh, they, it, they differ, Edward. That's what makes the conversation yes. okay. very uh, complicated in that regard. Yeah. So what I'd like to do for today, for the remainder of our program today, is look at some of the differences in the topics that were brought up during the uh, the dialogue and then sort of sum up our, pro, our, our review of this uh, this discussion. Sound good? Yes. All right, man. Well, uh, jumping right into it, um, I, I'm interested to hear your topics and notes that maybe came to mind as well, Edward. So I don't know if you have anything prepared, but uh, if you do, please uh, jump in or, uh, and of course, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on what I'm going to mention, but if you have anything you want to bring up, please feel free to jump in as well, okay? Okay, because I didn't write any notes while you guys were uh, speaking, because I wanted to kind of catch everything. Okay, mm -hmm. hey, that's fair. That's that's totally understood. We have different ways of studying, brother. Um, yeah. So uh, that being said, also to those of you that are viewing uh, here in our session, those of you that are viewing on social media, uh, if you feel that there's something you want us to cover, uh, please, um, let's let's do it. You know, uh, let, let me know. So um, and we'll go into discussion on that as well. So that being said, uh, the first thing that obviously I, I think of when I look back at that debate or that discussion was not a debate, folks, uh, is obviously what we meant from Isaiah chapter two, uh, the law will be established from Zion. Now, I believe that him and I, we had a little bit of a dialogue regarding the law because of Matthew chapter five, uh, verses 17 through 20. However, I think a more exhaustive understanding is needed regarding the law. And uh, as we've talked about, and Edward, you've mentioned the resource Torah to tell us uh, mm -hmm. by Dr. Don K. Preston. And I've mentioned a review I wrote on one of those volumes where I gave you basically, I copied from the book and I showed you the clear understandings of the, of the, uh, the law that Don Preston marks out. So uh, what I, I think Sean does, what I know now after watching a couple of his videos is he sort of picks and chooses and encourages his listeners, which is even kind of worse in my opinion, uh, to pick and choose what laws apply and what laws don't apply. I just finished watching a session of him where he says, you know, well, what do you do up until these times? You just have faith in Jesus. You just follow the laws that the Messiah followed. Uh, I meant to bring the books with me. There were two books that were put together, and I, I wanted to mention these during the dialogue with Sean, uh, two books put together by one by a pastor and one by a comedian. The first one is called The Year of Living Biblically. And what he does is he takes out different laws and he, uh, he highlights the complication with following them in today's society. Um, then uh, the other book would be the, the Year of Living Like Jesus, which was uh, by something, uh, I forget his name, Dobson, Pastor Dobson. And he marked out Old Testament principles that you would have to follow if you were going to truly live like Jesus. Um, I encourage people to look into those resources for two reasons information, but also humor, because there's quite a bit in there that was uh, uh, humorous in the comedian and in the pastoral one. Uh, another resource that uh, I found interesting is that there's a book by Shane Claiborne called Jesus for President. And in that book, he has a letter that a child is writing to his pastor or a teenager is writing to his pastor. And he's asking his pastor, uh, because of what his pastor taught on some, some things from the Old Testament, he's asking his pastor about all these other Old Testament verses and laws and how they would apply. And what that should do in the very least is stir us to be careful with our misappropriation of the law of Moses. If the book of Galatians itself is not, you know, exhortation enough. So my point in all of this is that we definitely had a different definition of the law. I would encourage study in that regard uh, because I think it's already clear uh, what the law was and what the new law, because again, in the New Testament, as you, uh, I think you marked out in a program the other day, Edward, was um, that 
the uh, the law would change, right? You brought up the verse where it says that the, with the new priesthood, the law would change in the book of Hebrews. So that being said, uh, we would have to establish, okay, so there was one law going forth from present day Jerusalem, from Zot, from you know the old, what was characteristic of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And then there was a new law and a new priesthood being ushered in uh, that would be characteristic of the new covenant, New Testament being brought through Jesus Christ. So do I have this as, as far as like you have the, you had the the uh, the covenant with Moses and uh, the priesthood of Aaron, right, which was passing away, and then Jesus uh, being the high priest in order of Melchizedek. Yes, well, that, again, that's what Hebrews is explaining, and that's part and parcel of the law. However, the law in the old to a Jew in the first century, the law was everything Moses said, everything David said, everything the prophets hoped for mm -hmm. being that was going to be fulfilled through the Messiah. So that's why the Apostle Paul, when he talks about the law is good and profitable, that's why he can say he preaches nothing other than the law and the prophets. That's why Jesus can say he's coming to fulfill the law and every jot, jot and tittle of the law. Mm -hmm. You know, he was fulfilling the law, the prophets, and the writings. Amen. And matter of fact, I believe it's uh, there's quite a few times where Jesus himself refers to the laws, the prophets, and the writings. That's what they were fulfilling. That's the law of Israel. That's what was coming to a conclusion in the first century through the ministry of Jesus. That's so what you're for, So for Sean to say to follow the law like Jesus did, good luck with that. Yeah, again, it, it doesn't work. Again, I think uh, Pastor Dobson's book will, I'll go ahead and read a little bit of it, maybe share some through my own personal social media. Uh, and through some of my work through the weekend or something, uh, maybe, just again, I'll encourage people to check out the resource. It just shows you the problem with doing that. And if I will, and if I can say this, it also shows you the problem with trying to piece, taking jots and tittles from the law. You know, again, the least of the commandments. One of the things I had mentioned during the dialogue was uh, what would Sean refer to as the least of the commandments? And I had done a little bit of research. The, uh, the the Old Testament, the Old Testament, you know, Old Covenant Jews in Israel, uh, the way the rabbis would teach the least of the commandments was uh, basically those principles about stealing a, a bird's egg from a mother's nest or um, eating a goat in, a mother, in its mother's milk. Uh, these were things that were considered the least, maybe not that one, actually. There's a couple basically environmental type of things that were considered the least of the laws. Uh, but again, they're very specific. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that means that the greater laws were things like, uh, you know, clothing not made of mixed fibers, because, again, understanding the distinction between themselves and the other nations was most important physically. That was mm -hmm. the point of the Old Covenant, to create a distinction and then to make them realize, if I may just sum it up, if th they were given a law and the purpose of that law was to make them realize that even though you've tried to follow this to the letter, and now, by the time of the first century, they built tradition upon tradition. What the Apostle Paul is making clear in the book of Galatians is that the goal of the law was to show them that they could not attain righteousness by following it. That's why Paul says, you know, we know that you cannot attain righteousness by the law. So, uh, again, th that's the point. So, you know, it's very, we need to be cautious with the law. So the, I would say, Edward, just in response to what you said there, the uh the definition of the law is the law and the prophets and the writings. That is Amen. everything, part and parcel. So uh, may, I, may I ask, um, like, say if a person did, you know, do the law to the jot and tittle, right? Perform the law, right? Uh, I don't. I still don't think he can achieve uh, righteousness because what what they're doing is with their own hands. What they're, they're doing acts. You can't work your way into God's grace. You know, it's, it takes faith. It's the condition of the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, 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 hmm. no, that, that, you're absolutely right. I wanted to let you complete your thought because you're right on track. If you remember, yeah. the rich man comes to Jesus. What does he say? I followed all the laws. Yes. I didn't, he said, what, what do I need to do? Jesus said, you know what to do. He told him the law. The man said, but I've done all of that. And then what did Jesus say? Go and sell all you have, which wasn't a law, but what is he testing? His heart. So again, mm -hmm. rightly said, Edward, uh, good point. Um, obviously, there was a big distinction between Sean and I in regards to the Zion, 
uh, the, the new covenant, which I've learned now after watching uh, one of his videos that I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, that he believes this is a literal place in the sky. Uh, you know, I've learned further. I knew during the dialogue that he believed that obviously because he mentioned it, but I've learned a bit further, uh, you know, his views. Uh, I would completely disagree with the way he's putting that together. I'd encourage people to go watch his video and watch the way he's putting it together and write your own notes and, and notice the problems with some of the thoughts that are mentioned there. Um, so uh, that being said, he said something that, you know, for me, he said it during the dialogue that I, I didn't catch. He said, you don't come into the new covenant until you have your new bodies. So what we need to be clear on here is that Sean does not believe that he's in the new covenant. I don't know where Sean believes he is because he's clearly not under the old covenant. You know, we live in New York. You go down to some of these villages in uh, Brooklyn uh, and you say that Sean's, a, you know, under the old covenant, he's a Jew. They're going to be very confused. You know, do I agree with them? By no means. Uh, but again, uh, my, my cousin, uh, my, my cousin, he, he happens to be a part of this messianic ministry. And, uh, you know, he would even admit that he doesn't do things like the Jews that are down in, in Brooklyn. So, you know, we, we need to be careful with that. You know, we need to be uh, very careful with the way we're attributing our, uh, the law to ourselves and calling ourselves uh, under the old covenant. Uh, but, you know, I don't know how that works. So uh, those are some things that I think needed to be marked out and obviously are a part of further study. I encourage people to watch through Sean Griffin's uh, video. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, in previous videos, I really encouraged it. The problem is now that I've watched it, he doesn't take you to too much Bible text. He takes you to extra biblical texts uh, that may be inspired, may not be inspired, uh, but you'd have to lean in on study of those documents first, understand the genre of literature they are and, and apply it appropriately. However, I've noticed I disagree with the way Sean's applying the literature of Revelation. Uh, it's a vision. It, it, it's a vision regarding something, you know. So, um, uh, you know, again, I've noticed he believes that uh, I don't know if you've looked into any of this, Edward, but he believes that because in Hebrews chapter, I forget what chapter it is, where there's the measurement of the things, uh, you know, above, uh, that Moses measured the tabernacle after the things above. They've applied this, that the tabernacle was modeled after the, the literal tabernacle that's in the heavens. So they believe there's this literal place that looks just like the tabernacle of God. Uh, but with far different dimensions, because obviously when you read the book of Revelation, I mean, the city of God is, it's a cube. There's more space above us than there is around us. Uh, if, you know, if everybody's, I don't know, maybe we're floating around. I, I don't, again, far too much imagination for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd rather dig into what the prophets understood, you know, how they would have understood their things rather than far out hopes. How does that scripture go where it says, uh, what Jesus said to the Pharisees, or someone, or, or, or however the scripture says, as far as uh, you've uh, made void the. Uh, yeah, you've made void the word of God by your traditions. Yes, that's it. Yeah, it's in the Gospel of Mark. Um, I forget what text. I want to say Gospel of Mark, chapter nine. Uh, but yeah, that's again, that's what's happening. You're, you're, you're missing the point, as we, we've explained mm -hmm. a bit of this yesterday. Um, you know, we talked about the tabernacle of God. What's interesting is, and you're right, you're right on Edward. Sean has basically done what I believe the Pharisees did in the first century. Mm -hmm. They believed that their restoration would take place in a physical form. Mm -hmm. And Sean, you know, he said in his video, restoration involves a place. Mm -hmm. It's a place that needs to come down literally from heaven. Mm -hmm. Which again, I would totally repudiate. And I know many futurists would, would obviously argue against that type of rendering of the text as well so you know again this would have been i wouldn't have had a dialogue about the day of the lord i would have rather dig into some of these topics first before we get to the table of dialoguing about the day of the lord mm -hmm. you know that's one thing i can say is that's what i appreciate about the way the church of christ sets up their dialogues they know that they all sort of agree on most of the things in the text uh, or the way their tradition has set it up that way when they get to the table with these things they can hammer home some text because they know, well, we're already previously believing this. However, I think even in their own camp, they're starting to realize the difference in that regard. So it just shows you how divided, unfortunately, Christianity is. So, uh, you know, again, a part and parcel of the tabernacle, the Mount Zion, the new covenant, the Jer heavenly Jerusalem is discussion about heaven, right? Heaven being up. And, uh, 
he said a direct quote from him was because of the definition of the word heaven from Genesis 1, 6 through 8, and how it is used in Hebrews 8, verses 1 through 5, in addition to Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 15, a literal city, yes. So he believes that heaven, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is a place up, mm -hmm. a literal place. So you know, I, th this is a conversation that I wasn't prepared for as we, again, we've already dealt with above, right? If I may, uh, just bring us to some text quickly on above, and then we could get with, uh, get into a talk a little bit about heaven. Uh, James chapter one, and we already, in our uh, discussion and on the blog, I've listed James chapter three, but here in James chapter one, it says, and also yesterday we let in on the things unseen and quite a few different things mm -hmm. in regards to the tabernacle of God uh, and above. We, we've talked about this above concept, but real quickly. Sorry, flipping through the wrong part of my Bible. I got to recite that alphabet. I always forget the, uh, the thing, the acronym that was created for remembering where your books are in your Bible. All right, here in James chapter one, verse 17. Sorry about that. Um, it says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Okay. And also, if you just continue into verse 18, he chose to give birth, to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So again, you can take this very literal and you can have coming down being somewhere in the sky. But then if you're going to go that, you know, uh, that far, I guess, heavenly lights, they may take literal as well. And some people may make that work. Then they, you have to take uh, the birth, you know, the type of birth without totally, you know, misapplying John chapter three, of course. Uh, then the word of truth, we've been birthed through the word of truth, uh, as we talked about yesterday a bit, you know, Christ being born in us. Uh, that, you know, again, how do we understand that? Uh, what does it mean that the hope of glory is Christ in us, uh, that, that we'd be, we're part of the tabernacle, the temple of God? Uh, he get, chose to give birth to us through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits uh, that he created. Now, I don't know how you feel about being called the fruit, Edward, but, uh, you know, I, I don't apply that <laughs> word to myself uh, very often, you know. So yeah. uh, my point being that first, we don't apply that literally. Uh, yeah. you, uh, we, we know that it's talking about there's Jewish imagery being used here, you know, yeah. about the, the first fruit. So that being said, uh, you know, if you just jump in and start taking things literally in your Bible, you can end up in some strange places. I just want to warn folks of that. Yeah, I have wanted to say, you know, about every good, uh, good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, you know, like the gifts that's given to us, like those that have musical uh, talents, uh, uh, gifted in various areas that would produce their calling okay these gifts are given from the holy spirit god has given you these gifts you know uh none it doesn't have to necessarily be from the holy spirit because some people don't have the holy spirit and they have gifts you know but god, but it comes from above because god has given them these gifts you know but you know uh you're right. Amen. If I, if I may add on to your thought there, uh, what I will say is that we talked about this at study the other day, rain falls on the just yes. and the unjust, right? And, uh, you know, Jesus wasn't saying that to remind them how the weather works. He was using that as a spiritual uh, metaphor for, you know, how God uh, causes, you know, good things to happen to the both the good and the bad that, you know, mm -hmm. that in the way that we should be treating people, you know, uh, we should be treating yes. people like God does that he's, he's he has a common good for all people. And, um, you know, so that being said, where does rain come from? Above, right? And obviously, the, I, I know there's different arguments. We talked a little bit about the firmament. Maybe we'll lead in on that here in a moment. Um, that actually is a part of the biblical cosmology discussion. I think we're, we've already slated some discussion for a future time regarding Genesis. I've mentioned yeah. quite a few different resources on my understanding of Genesis 1 through 3. Matter of fact, since today is Flash Forward Friday, at the end of our program here, I get to provide some exciting announcements regarding some discussion uh, on Genesis and preterism. Uh, so that being said, um, 
Yeah, so there's a big uh, misunderstanding in the way that we're applying, we're over literalizing the things in scripture. Hyper literalizing is the actual way that you would you would say that. Uh, so um, here, if I may, we're, we just talked about rain, right? And we know rain biblically and prophetically represents blessings, right? So what, what we'd say is God causes blessings to fall on the just and the unjust. Uh, mm-hmm. Another thing that we should be thinking about when we read this, when I read every good and perfect gift is from above, I think about what Peter says, and I'm actually going to mention this at the end of our program, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, everything has been given to us pertaining to life and godliness. So again, right here in the context of James 1 and in the context of 2 Peter chapter 1, what it's talking about is literally everything. Everything that happens to you, everything that happens through you, everything that happens around you is provided from above. The fact that you woke up today, we use that all the time, a famous uh, I finally learned how to say the word the other day, adage, a famous adage uh, that we all say or a phrase that we often say is, be grateful that you woke up today. God made you wake up today. So again, everything, the context of this text here in James chapter one is that everything has been given to you from above. Now, again, we don't believe that everything that we've been given floated down from the literal sky. Again, what does it mean by from above? From God. As I had mentioned during the dialogue with Sean Griffin, that the language of fr- from above is imagery of things being provided from God. Yeah. If I may uh, show you, uh, I mentioned James 3. I want to, uh, John 3. I want to take us over to John 3 just to show you further illustration of this phrase above. John 3 3. Now, again, one thing I did appreciate from the Sean. Uh, Griffin discussion was a challenge to ask ourselves why we believe what we believe. Now, many people, this this above understanding is an often assumed understanding for most Christians. Again, even myself, I thought that most, if not all, Christians believe that when they read above, from above in the New Testament, that they understood it to be from God. However, I I realized, talking to Sean, that not everybody believes that. So it inspired me to go ahead and say, well, why do I believe that? And hopefully, as I went through the other day, yesterday, and excuse me, and, and I am now, it's showing you why I would believe that from above means from God. Uh, here in John 3, 3, Jesus replied, for truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, uh, most scholars and biblical commentators have noted that that's not necessarily the correct rendering of what's being said there. The correct rendering would be born from above. So mm-hmm. what is contrasting? He's contrasting natural birth, And then he's contrasting being born from above, not Mm -hmm. coming down from the sky, Mm -hmm. but being brought into the things of God, which again, we know the spirit of God. That's the context here. The spirit of God uh, is the only thing that can cause you to see the kingdom of God. And they can't insert a physical body, a new physical body. They can't insert that. Oh, yeah. And we're going we're gonna to get there in a moment. I hear you on that one. Again, <laughs> the physical body of Jesus coming, a physical body of you getting a physical body in the kingdom of God again. Very problematic discussion. I, I agree. Uh, and we're going to lean in on that resurrection discussion here in a moment. Um, so, and Edward, you're following what I'm saying about the above, I'm sure, correct? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I believe the same thing. I hope so. I hope spirituality, so. True spirituality comes from above, from God. True spirituality, you know, uh, influence from God. True spirituality. And... Uh, yeah. It, just before I mentioned that uh, this comes by way of the spirit, right? Just, just as you're noting. So let's add some feet to that argument. Look over at verse seven, John three, verse seven. I'm sorry, John three, verse five. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I'm reading it wrong here. We'll, we'll just start at verse five. Jesus answered, for truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God until, unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born from above. The wind blows wherever it pleases and wherever it is, uh, from, uh, I'm sorry, from wherever it comes from and wherever it is going. So it is with the born, those born of the spirit. So again, being born from above is being born of the spirit. That's the, the correlation uh, that's being provided right there from John chapter three. Uh, Another text I would bring up in this context here is verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Again, we talked about light yesterday a bit, so that it may be be seen plainly 
what they have has, has been done, has been done in the sight of God. So again, here we see uh, John from John chapter one, all the way through to three. He's using imagery of being born from above, being born of the spirit, being born of light, being born of the kingdom of God. Uh, again, uh, this is what is being done to show that it's of God, that it's from God. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would be the point of uh, my, me bringing it up. If I may, uh, John 19, 11, another text that will lead us in on that above point. Notice what Jesus says here. Remember, this is Jesus about to be crucified. And listen what he says to Pilate. Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. So was Pilate, did Jesus float down from the sky and arrive in the hands of Pilate? No. We understand that what Jesus is saying here is that this is being done of God, that mm -hmm. this is from above, that this is from God. So again, very clear text that, again, in my estimation, I thought everybody agreed on this. I didn't realize that there was people that were erroneously teaching this. And then again, uh, as we mentioned the other day, James chapter three, uh, I'm not going to bring us all the way back over there, but it, it in envelopes this conversation of the things that are provided from above. Uh, we talked about yes before, uh, Edward, you brought up the gifts, uh, the things of the spirit, fruits of the spirit. Second uh, Peter chapter one leads in on all the things that we need to be uh, possessing and increasing in to grow in effectiveness and fruitfulness of the things of God. That's focusing on things that are above my friends. That's the, you know, that's what we need to be focused on. And that's what we need to be living in to be members of the body of Christ, be citizens of the new Jerusalem, if you will. And uh, so that's that point. If I may just return back to what we were saying about heaven, uh, bring us back to a bit of sanity about heaven, not about a place up there. Uh, sorry if that sounds mean spirited, but it's true. You know, that view, that view is insane. It, 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 it's not correct. It's erroneous. And it leads to a lot of other problems and stems from uh, dare I say, some psychological uh, and, and uh, cultural uh, issues that we have uh, regarding what Christ has provided not being enough. And uh, that being said, uh, when we talk about heaven, I have a resource that I'm actually about to read. Uh, heaven is a tough topic to lean in on. I did a video a couple years ago with Mike Ferris where we talked about heaven and earth. And interestingly enough, we quoted and used resources from N.T. Wright, Dr. N.T. Wright. I mentioned that because Don Preston is currently doing his morning musings, reviewing resources uh, from N.T. Wright on heaven. So uh, I'm obviously going to post some links. There's, there's a flashback, a flash forward Friday resource for you. Uh, Don Preston going through this topic. Just visit his YouTube page, of course, Dr. Don K. Preston. I will provide the links in my update on this podcast. Um, also, I'm leading in on another resource I have. Uh, I received the Free Grace Broadcaster. I encourage people to go ahead and sign up for it. Just Google Free Grace Broadcaster. And if you do so, uh, every month or every, I think it's a bi-monthly, you'll receive a, a bunch of little magazines. And what you, and each of those magazines of the Free Grace, Grace Broadcaster, uh, Free Grace Broadcaster, is uh, usually on a certain topic. And it's from the Reformed standpoint. So they have writers that uh, contribute, or usually it's writers from, let's say, the 17th and 18th century uh, and their thoughts on certain topics. So the most recent one was actually on heaven. So I'm excited to uh, dive into that study and read through their thoughts. Uh, so those are two resources I've already mentioned. And then uh, if I may say this, Edward, um, I think that we need to have a, either bring it on and make it something here uh, on our program or do a future conference on the topic of the afterlife in heaven from a preterist standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, you think that that's necessary? I, I don't know where the Bible speaks on, on that. Uh, that's a good point. So I would agree with you. Um, I think that there's a very vague uh, understanding of what exactly is going to happen beyond biological death. Just yesterday, the reason why I believe this is important is just yesterday I saw somebody posting the question on a Facebook group for preterists and uh, obviously a large conversation began. Uh, and then this morning I found three other posts where people were asking questions uh, about this. So I realize it's a need, people are asking questions and if we're going to advance and people are going to come into the preterist movement, we obviously want to have answers for them 
uh, in that regard. So one text I regularly bring up, or two texts for that matter, is uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, where it says, uh, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. And again, that is being done at the conclusion of the destruction of Babylon. Mm -hmm. So what is that saying? That at the destruction of Jerusalem, there uh, something happened uh, for those that would die in the Lord. Now that brings us to our next point. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is talking about the dead ones. The dead ones were those that were in Sheol. They were the faithful dead that needed to be judged and brought into the very heavenlies, the holiest of all, uh, you know, the, the holy temple. So they needed to be brought in. So what 1 Corinthians is getting at is not necessarily whether they already knew the living believers have resurrection through Jesus. If you mm -hmm. notice in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, they're members of the church. Uh, they're, they're people that are in Christ. They understand Christ rose. They understood the teachings of Jesus. What they're denying is that the dead ones are going to receive resurrection. And uh, that, again, that brings us into a whole other conversation. However, my point would be this. Obviously, the assumption was that if there was a resurrection of those dead ones, they would go from one place to another. Amen. Now, what that experience is, we, we probably need to put some feet under that discussion. Uh, I don't know how or where we would lean in I on think it. Jesus, I think Jesus uh, uh, answered that. He said, his kingdom is not of this world. He's, he's king of kings, lord of lords, you know, in his kingdom. Um, when, uh, us being born again, we died to ourselves. So we died with Christ and we are raised with Christ. We are in heavenly places with Christ. So therefore, we're, we're there now. <laughs> so right. as far as what happens after we shed this, I don't know. You know, I, I know it will be more probably enlightening, but current, but for, for what I see now that we're in it, you know, the, the blessings that, that the Bible describes and what we're to um, possess and uh, increase in as far as uh, Galatians 5 and, and, and 2 Peter 1. So we're to do these things and we're to be that light to draw men unto God, you know, That's to right. bring people into the, into the gates that never close. That's right. So that's what we're to be doing. So I, beyond that, you know. And I agree with you. I, I'm glad that you're as, as, you're as, as comfortable with the concept that we don't know as I am. And, and you outlined it rather well, uh, what we should be focused on and what we should appreciate. So uh, that being said, I'm not against leaning in on study of it. So I will say this, uh, Ward Fenley has some great teachings about heaven. Um, Dr. Don K. Preston, as I already mentioned, is leaning in on discussion in that regard. And what we might do is we might make it a focus of a week long program. We might work on, if I have my way, uh, actual in-person conference uh, where we focus on that and uh, maybe that could be a year out or something that we might work on as the Power of Preterism Network. Again, all that and more in a moment here. Uh, so that's something that we could do, but I encourage people, uh, there's some resources out there from the Preterist view uh, that will help you lean in on that topic. Uh, however, I haven't found any that are exact or that exhausting. Uh, that being said, uh, we talked a little bit about the literal bodily coming of Jesus Christ. Obviously, I disagree with that view. Uh, I believe that I made my point uh, from Matthew 16, uh, verses 27 through 28, that Jesus was going to come in the glory of the Father. Uh, the, the, the way to understand coming of the glory of the Father was through war and nations warring with one another. Uh, and also there could be imagery of clouds for two reasons. Uh, the first reason being nations running across the desert tend to kick up dust. Uh, and the second reason would be God can do miracles in the sky. Uh, it's his world. He can do things to over exasperate, if you will, the point of what he's trying to make. Uh, we know that with the veil, I always wondered, you, you know, God didn't need to make the veil rip uh, during the crucifixion of Jesus. But what was the point? To for, you know, for visual effect. God does uh, bring forth visual effect, just like you and I have backgrounds here on this session. Uh, we don't need them, but they add a little bit of, you know, uh, a further benefit uh, for the viewer or for those that are uh, watching our session or those that are watching God in, in that example. Um Regarding the literal, bo literal bodily coming of Jesus, uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, I believe we exhausted that text yesterday, talking about uh, the kingdom of God coming without observation. Uh, and then, of course, we leaned in on other portions of Luke chapter 17, talking about the coming of the Lord. Uh, Edward, I believe you bring this up often, and I, I, I think it's, it's correct to bring it up, that the physical body, bodily resurrection of Jesus was the sign of Jonah. 
That's why he needed to physically rise, right? It was to fulfill that which was spoken of by Jonah. And Jesus said that. He said that, you know, I will go into the belly of the earth just as Jonah was in the belly of the beast uh, for three days and three nights. So I will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and we'll come out. So, you know, yes. So Jesus. So needed- he had to come out physically because if he came out uh, spirit in the spirit, no one can see him. <laughs> right. That's right. So, so where's so, the proof? You know, yes. So the proof had to come physical, yeah. Yeah, so again, for Jesus, that was necessary. And then for, uh, then another text that I would bring up in that regard, obviously that was brought up in the dialogue with Sean Griffin was Acts chapter one, verses nine through 11, where in my estimation, it tells you that Christ descended into the clouds. The clouds took him out of their sight. And obviously that was the illustration of him going into heaven. And then the way that, the, the, the angel's answer is they don't say the same way you've seen Jesus go up into the clouds, you're going to see him come. They say the same way you've seen Jesus go into heaven, you're going to see him come. And how did he enter into heaven? Hidden in the clouds. The text bears that out. So, um, you know, and again, it's not necessarily talking about the exact nature. I know uh, Don Preston has done some work in that regard. Uh, there's an article out there by a man named, uh, oh man, I haven't talked to him in a while, Ray. Uh, I want to get the resource and share with everybody in regards to Acts chapter one, verses nine through 11. I know I have plenty of printed out copies, but I'm sure it's available somewhere on the internet. And uh, I'll make that resource available uh, for people to uh, look into in regards to Acts chapter one, verses nine through 11. So lastly, I'll mention this in regards to the literal coming of Jesus. When you enter into this, the reading of Revelation, uh, we know Jesus comes as a lamb. Jesus comes as a lion. Uh, We've all seen those pictures. So I think we're all in agreement that Jesus is not going to come as a lion. Jesus comes with tattoos riding on a horse, Uh, you know, and part of the imagery there. Remember, he has on his thigh, it is written. I know some people find that to be blasphemous, but that's what the text says. Um, Then uh, there's also, um, and I guess for that matter, we talked about the mark of the beast last week. Uh, the people of God have image, you know, the name of God written on their forehead. That's the tattoo. Uh, so uh, that being said, um, if, if you're going to take it literally, of course, we know that that's not what I'm talking about. Um, my point being is then the book of Revelation, Jesus also comes with animals, right? I, I seen a picture the other day where it was, it said, uh, Jesus is going to come the same way he left. And it had him coming with a, a whole bunch of animals. And I wrote on the comments, I said, is this the same way that they saw Jesus leave? You know, no, I'm sorry. There's nothing in the book of Revelation uh, that we would say is the way that they saw Jesus leave other than the glory of God, that he was caught up in the glory of God and he would come in the glory of God. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what we understand to have happened in the first century. So, no, we don't believe in a literal bodily coming of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I don't believe the scriptures warrant that view. Um, other things that we marked out, and obviously we're getting to the end of our program here, uh, was prolepsis. Uh, you know, and what I think with this, and that wasn't a disagreement. I just think that's an area that we need further dialogue. We need to understand uh, when scripture is using proleptic thought and saying something that was far out, you know, like we've been seated in the heavenlies, but we know that they had not yet, uh, the the resurrection, the consummation of the kingdom, if you will, was not yet in place. Uh, But I do believe that the living saints, when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, were seated in the heavenlies, just as much as I believe is the reality today. So uh, again, I think there's discussion that needs to be had on what texts are proleptic and what texts are time statements. And um, so that's, you know, we talked about Matthew chapter five uh, in that regard, uh, you know, that not one jot or tittle would pass from the law until all was fulfilled. Um, Matthew chapter 24, uh, which again, I think makes time statements rather clear. Uh, you know, the time of the uh, destruction of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Uh, we know, again, there's been so many studies put together uh, showing you Matthew 24 fulfilled. So uh, I don't know that we ever really need to lean in on that other than encouraging people to view the resources that are already out there. Uh, so again, uh, the, you know, that's Luke 21, the same thing. Acts chapter one, we've mentioned some resources. And what we need to really uh, ask ourselves is what, when we're, when we're considering, this is something I wrote in my notes here, when we're considering proleptic and uh, time texts, we need to ask ourselves like proleptic text, meaning, and again, hopefully you understand what was going on there, Edward, uh, in regards to that proleptic type of language, you know, like uh, we've been saved, but then we're going to be saved or, um, you know, 
the kingdom of God is in your midst. He tried to assert that, well, I would agree in part that they weren't in the full kingdom of God yet, right? So that text is not mm -hmm. saying in the kingdom of God. It's speaking mm -hmm. proleptically. Okay. I don't think, I think that that text was Jesus asserting that he was the kingdom of God and that they were not noticing it. But that's, again, the way that we're understanding what Jesus was saying there. Um, my point being, uh, we would need to ask what they're waiting for. You know, what, what was the kingdom? What, and I wrote in my notes here, Acts chapter 3, verse 21, where it talks about the uh, restitution of all things or Hebrews 9, 10, reformation of all things. Um, Revelation 21, you know, the presence of God coming down to be with them. I would make the case that it was, they were waiting for the change of covenant and the, the presence of God. You know, the old covenant could not provide the presence of God. It manifested sin. It made them an unholy temple, an unholy body in which God could not dwell. And Christ, the spirit, would create his people to be that temple. So- Amen. You know, I mean, yeah, that's that's the gospel, right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and then uh, the last point I'd bring up uh, in this regard uh, would be, uh, what does it mean that Jesus is the resurrection? Do you remember that part of the dialogue? He said to me, what does it mean that Jesus is the resurrection? And what is my hope as a preterist? Obviously, I've seen some of the comments from detractors of our view where they say that we're hopeless, which, you know, for me makes no sense. Uh, however, uh, that would mean that after they would believe that after the coming of the Lord, uh, according to their view, that there would be no more hope, uh, which again, we know Proverbs talks about a hope deferred makes the heart sick, a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Uh, hardly the understanding that most people seem to have that if your, if your desire is fulfilled, then you have no more hope. Uh, no, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, you, you have something greater, you have a fulfilled hope, you have a reality to stand upon and live in and thrive in and you know, so again, a uh, strange view there. Uh, you should increase your faith because uh, the hope of Israel has been fulfilled. So that gives us greater hope. That's right. That's right. So if I may, I want to just show you some text. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses, verse 16 is where I want to start. And we're going to get better at our hour of power here, but, uh, you know, I, <laughs> patient with us as we did this review, a lot of this was me getting some things off my chest that I hope would bring clarity to the things that were brought up in a confusing conversation. So uh, here in verse 16, uh, again, this gives us some background and some context. I want to have us kind of read through this whole portion here of John chapter five. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now, again, I think we're all familiar with what was happening. Jesus was doing things that they felt were unlawful. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day. I, too, am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself. You started, this is Matthew 5, 16. You started. Yes, Matthew 5. I'm sorry. John 5, 16. OK. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we're leaning in on a discussion here about Jesus being the resurrection. Yes. So I'm going to pick up, if you don't mind, uh, now that I read that, I'm just going to pick up here at verse 19. Yes. So they're obviously the Pharisees are aggravated with him. Jesus gave them this answer. Truly, I tell you, the son of man can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, so that all, honor the, that, all that honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. For as the father has life in himself, 
so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And so he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be amazed for a time is coming when all who are in their graves who have done what is good will rise to live and those who have done what is evil will rise to condemnation. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just for I seek not to please myself, but to seek him to please him who sent me. So again, I could go on and I think it's important to finish off the reading with the rest of the uh, chapter because it gets in on the light and the discussion that we were talking about the other day uh, with light and darkness in regards to the covenant and, and how Jesus attributes himself to be the light of men, the life of men. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to mention that text uh, real quickly. I have it written down here. Uh, that's John chapter one, verse four. So here, what do we have going on? We have Jesus asserting, talking to the Pharisees, that he is he has authority to work on the Sabbath. That's the direct response because the father works on the Sabbath. And then he goes on to say that he who hears my words uh, has eternal life and he will not be judged. Again, Romans 8, 1, a text, you know, to he who has spiritual life, uh, he who has Christ does not fall into condemnation. Uh, because again, we know the death that we're talking about here is, is not physical death, but is spiritual death or covenant death, fellowship death, if you will. But I tell you, a time is coming and has now come, notice that, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So now, there are the dead of the old covenant, right? Those people that never heard the gospel but died prior to the gospel. Then there's the dead that are standing in front of Jesus that when they hear the gospel, they have the opportunity to come to life. And then, of course, we know that through Christ, there's the promise of the resurrection of the dead, that through him, the dead would be raised and would be brought into you know, eternal life as well. But there would also be a judgment of the unjust, the resurrection of them as well, uh, Daniel chapter 12. So all of this is bringing into thought the, the understanding that what about the old covenant dead? And what Christ is simply saying here is that a time has come now where you can believe in me and experience resurrection, but it will also come upon those that die uh, that they would be judged at the coming of the Lord, that, you know, again, the dead ones would be judged at the coming of the Lord. Uh, that's what that language of coming out of the grave, coming out of Sheol, uh, would depict. Uh, Daniel chapter 12's resurrection, the resurrection that would happen at the destruction of the power of the holy people. Uh, so again, uh, you know, and, and I believe this is completely conceptual. Again, if you get your understanding of spirituality, your understanding of things that come from above, things that are provided above, I think, once you get into this discussion, it should become clear as to what Christ is talking about, you know, in regards to resurrection, that it's spiritual realities. Okay, what you just described. Okay, I, I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Okay, what, what you just described in that scripture um, about <clears throat> the, the, the ones that were dead that heard his voice, that they would live. Okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that when, when it comes time for judgment, I, I don't know if this applies, but when, when it comes time for judgment for those that uh, will, will go to glory and those that will, you know, go to the grave, um, probably this, script, this, this portion here kind of gives the description to whereas, you know, he's just going to call his that, that can hear him. Right. And they and they'll and they'll come up and the ones that are in the grave they're just gonna you know be right. gone. Yeah, again, I think there's again, and as we know, I'll say this: in the first century, there were a variety of views regarding yeah. what would come of the dead ones and, and how they would be raised. Josephus has a what I, in my opinion, an over Hellenized perspective in his writing, a discourse on Hades. Uh, you know, so again, there's a lot that goes into that, uh, you know, disc discussion about hell and everything else leads in on that. Yeah. So um, my point being here that in John five, Jesus is simply saying that he can provide resurrection. He is the means of life in John chapter 11. If you go further, a couple chapters, John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus literally says, I am the resurrection. So you don't need to go too far. It wasn't, you know, during that dialogue, Sean seemed a bit confused by me saying that, but that's what Jesus said. Amen. 
you know, so again, uh, and then if I may, as I mentioned before, John 1, 4, Jesus says, I am the light and I am the life of men. Jesus yeah. is the life of men. Then yeah. uh, moving a bit further in John 3, you know, just to kind of catch us up to where we are in John 11, to fill, you know, give feet to that argument. In John 3, 16, Jesus says, we all know it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, as per what Sean's putting together, the argument is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall die, but one day will have eternal life, but they will not perish. That doesn't make sense. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus already previously said in John 5, that if you believe in me, that you go from life to death, you know, that you, you've, you go from death to life. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, and then, well, not previously, he now after that, obviously in John five, he explains that if you believe in me, you've gone from a life from death to life. I have to get that one right. Um, and then furthermore, in John 14, six, Jesus says, what I am the way, the truth and the life. No man can get to the father except through me. So again, Jesus is making it rather clear as to what it means that he is the resurrection, that he is the one that's bringing that life and light to men that was waited for throughout the Old Testament. And matter of fact, it correlates with what the Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, that Christ, who is your life, when he appears, we will appear with him in glory. Again, so we know that eternal life and glory are synonymous, are these spiritual unseen promises that were given to the people of God that we attain, not that we will attain, that we attain through Jesus Christ. If I may say one last thing in that regard, uh, eight years ago on social media, here's a flashback Friday for you. Uh, eight years ago on social media, I wrote, if physical death is the effect of sin, which again, most futurists believe the reason why we physically die is because we're still bearing the weight of sin. Sin brought forth death, physical, biological death. Well, if that be the case, then... We, pay, we all pay the price for our sins. Yeah, man. That's a problem. And I wrote here in my notes, but didn't Jesus say, and if you go to Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So Jesus said that if we repent, we won't perish. Notice that. You too will perish. So if we repent, we won't perish. Well, that doesn't make any sense because these guys keep telling me that if I, I repent, I'm still going to perish. And then Jesus is going to give me resurrection. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Obviously, the resurrection, the life that he's promising is contrasted with perishing. And it has nothing to do with physically dying. Otherwise, we all pay the penalty for our own sin. I like how Don K. Preston posed the question, is physical death an enemy? to the child of God. Right. Yeah, he has a great article on that. Amen. So yes. Bring up. I might actually include that in our resources. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, good article to read. Is physical death the enemy of the child of God, right? Yes. Amen. Good stuff. And then, of course, if I might add Romans 8.1, you know, the Apostle Paul says, for there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So we can't bear the penalty for our own sin. It just does not work. Um, simply put, our view, what God has provided in the here and now, uh, according to Sean Griffin, is not good enough. Uh, there has to be a better experience. That's what many futurists and what Sean Griffin is unfortunately fostering. There has to be a better experience. And, and that's a problem for me, obviously, because we know Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, wherein we are told that to the living saints, he has provided all things pertaining to life and godliness. And so, then when we get into the study of the second exodus, that's the purpose of the second exodus, to free us from sin. That's right. Exactly. That's, and I'm glad you mentioned that because real quickly, we're going to move in on some uh, announcements and thoughts before uh, I'll bring some folks on if they want to share some closing thoughts in regards to this dialogue that we had uh, all these last five days. Uh, but real quickly, uh, if I had it my way, remember I said I was going to bring us through a discussion on if I had it my way. I'm not going to provide that whole thing here. I might do a video on my own time. However, if I had it my way, what we would have done was taken a look at the quote unquote qualifiers that Sean brought up in his video on the day of the Lord. 
and we would have went through the text. He started with 2 Thessalonians 2. I'd make the case that what Sean's offering, nobody could have believed at the time of the first century uh, that the day of the Lord had already occurred. So it makes not much good. It, it doesn't make sense out of what Thessalon what's happening in Thessalonica in the first century that some had already come to the view that the day of the Lord had occurred. Uh, so I thought the best way to go about that discussion, uh, what we should have done was taken a look at those texts and, and began to see what was going on. And my biggest problem with his view is that he imposes. If you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul explains why the day of the Lord had not occurred and what they could expect. If you listen to Sean Griffin's two-hour, three-hour teaching, he adds quite a bit to what they needed to expect that I would make the case Paul is not saying. So uh, that would, would have been the way that I would have went about that discussion. And for just a real quick moment here, I'm going to share a graphic on the screen. Uh, this is a graphic that I encourage people. I'll share it on our social media and on our site. This is a graphic I was going to share during that dialogue to help people get a better handling on the biblical time frame for the return of Christ. And if you read there, it brings up text, you know, as we talked about yesterday, Matthew 24, 34, Matthew 24, 44, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, where the Apostle Paul said that these things were written for those upon whom the ends of the ages had come there at Corinth. Uh, again, I'll share this graphic on our blog uh, for this discussion uh, for everybody to be edified by. But again, uh, that's what I would have encouraged people to uh, look into. There's a website at the bottom, godisrealtoday. No, I think that's just a mark on my screen. God is real today backslash second coming. And I encourage everyone to review that resource as well. And um, that's what I would have done. You know, and if I, uh, one last thing before I bring us in on announcements, Edward, um, I looked into the responses. Now, I don't know about everybody here, but the response, three groups of people that I cared about in regards to their responses were, uh, you know, the churches, people here at our local church. And I know uh, I was very encouraged to see at our following night study, uh, the following day, uh, somebody came in and was just cheering me on. Like, you know, you did great. That was a great discussion. Uh, so that was very encouraging. Uh, I think uh, for the most part, we all sort of agreed with things we've outlined for the last five days here at the church. Um, then I received some phone calls and messages from other people. Obviously, most were things we've shared on this program, frustrated with the outline, frustrated with the topics that were brought up. Uh, some people had called me and encouraged me uh, for other discussions with him, things that we might need to outline that I've brought up here in this session. And um, then, of course, the YouTube comments. Now, I had previously decided I wanted to go back and answer every one of the YouTube comments. I might still do so, but it's going to be a lot of work. If I may just share with you the, the most recent comment, and maybe use this as an outline to help people get a better handling of what we're saying as preterists and what our problem would be with what Sean Griffin is saying. This person said, preterism is nothing more than the enemy's attempt to have believers disobey Yeshua's command to watch for the events he told us would come to pass by telling us that they did come to pass and doing this by use of the writings of a Pharisee named Josephus, who was also a traitor to his own people and who countless scholars have said his writings have been tampered with, and the sources they tend to use as second and third witnesses base their writings on what Josephus said. Ignore them. Listen to Yeshua. Keep watching and always be ready. So if I may just quickly respond to that, and Edward, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'll say, uh, Preterism is not telling people not to watch. Again, I think you should live with your eyes wide open. You should be paying attention. And if things do seem eerily similar to things that we read and know in history or things we read in scripture, obey Jesus's commands. Now, again, uh, one of Jesus's commands to the first century disciples was to flee to the mountains. I don't know if Sean and his friends are uh, working on that. Uh, however, um, that was one of the commands that we obviously know, or maybe they believe it's going to be at a later date as I had previously believed in my former eschatology. So um, yeah, but nobody's telling Christians not to live with their eyes wide open. Uh, as far as following the commands of Jesus, uh, I listened to Sean on his program. And as I mentioned before, his encouragement to people is to, you know, love the Lord with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, follow the commands that Jesus did uh, and, um, and wait and watch. So we can do that. We can agree with them in that regard. Let's live like that. Uh, let's, you know, pay heed to what the scriptures teach. And uh, again, without, obviously, I would say arbitrarily imposing hopes that are not there. 
And then lastly, uh, in regards to Josephus, uh, we know that Josephus was a traitor. So we know that, and we know that he possibly uh, added elements to over, you know, overemphasize certain things, certain historical points, that's possible. Uh, maybe even had biases in writing history. If you know a historian that doesn't have bias, I'd be interested to know who that would be. Uh, probably would be Jesus. Uh, that would be the only person or, or, you know, that existed on this planet that doesn't have a bias. So um, that being said, uh, I actually think that adds credibility. And uh, we know that there are areas we just need to be cautious in any regard reading anybody's writings other than the inspired scriptures of God. So I don't know how you feel about that comment, Edward. Well, I just feel that who was he speaking to uh, at that period? It was the first century uh, people. Um, why would uh, it apply to us? He wasn't speaking to us. He was speaking to them. So right. what did it mean to them at that particular time? And that's what we're to glean from. That's right. <laughs> yeah. As you know, the view, unfortunately, has us arriving at uh, that it meant nothing to them. God was speaking over their head to people 2,000 years far removed, plus 2,000 plus years removed. So um, again, so I just thought it was interesting that there's a lot of strange comments on there, uh, a lot of good comments as well. I want to appreciate the people that viewed the video and took the time uh, as strange as I might view your views. Uh, I appreciate that you were willing to be a part of the dialogue, view the dialogue, and even mention, you know, the things in comments. So I appreciate in that regard. Uh, Edward, uh, you mind if we uh, do our flashback, flash forward Friday as we've taken up a bit more time than we had anticipated. Sure. Cool. All right. So do you have anything? Uh, obviously, our first resource I want to make mention of uh, would be the this discussion. If you go to powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, there will be a link to the Griffin Miano dialogue or discussion on the day of the Lord. And if you go there, almost all the links that you've heard us mention, Larry Siegel's links today, Don Preston's resources, uh, resources that we've posted on the power of preterism in years before, resources from myself, other study resources will all be found at that link pertaining to this dialogue. So uh, we want to encourage you to visit that. Uh, Edward, I'm not sure. Do you have anything else uh, as we continue along? Uh, just jump in if you feel there's things you want to say. No, there's nothing currently. <laughs> all right. Um, well, then cool. Then this will all be good for you too. give you some encouragement. Um, one thing I want to ask for prayer as a matter of announcement is for Dallas Willard. Uh, I'm sorry, not Dallas Willard, Dallas Burdett, uh, Dallas Willard, prayer for his family. He's a, a theologian that passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, Dallas Burdett uh, is a theologian that uh, has a great website, um, forgetting the name of the website off the top of my head. However, we'll share that in this resource as well. Prayers for him as he was going to visit with Daniel Rogers this past, uh, the coming, this coming weekend, and he was in an accident. And I uh, want to pray for him as he heals and recovers. Pray, he, he's well. Uh, they're expecting him to come and visit with them in weeks to come. Dallas Burdett continues to be a great theologian prayerfully. Uh, maybe we'll have him here on the Preterist Power Hour uh, in weeks to come and uh, invite him to join with us and maybe tell us about what he did there at North Broad Church with, um, with Daniel Rogers. Uh, so again, prayers in that regard and obviously opportunity for us to possibly be talking with him in the future. Um, this coming Monday, January 17th is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, for me, in my estimation, this is a great way to go about self-examination, go about renewal, go about reformation, go about service. Again, they've marked it out in this country as a day of service. So uh, I know we will, uh, here at the church, we're going to have an event at 7 p.m. And obviously we're excited to announce, which we will again here in a moment, uh, that we'll have Daniel Rogers joining us at 9 p.m. on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. However, we will not be having a morning session at 11 a.m. We will postpone our session to the 9 p.m. session uh, due to other events regarding the holiday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, so that being said, uh, no, not next Monday, uh, don't be here at 11 a.m. Uh, if you can possibly consider joining with us for a live discussion with Daniel Rogers uh, on at 9 p.m. Eastern on Monday night. A uh, conference I want to share with everyone, an upcoming conference, the most uh, recent that I know of at this moment that's being planned is the Rethinking Resurrection, Rethinking the Resurrection Conference happening in Rogersville, Tennessee. This will be on March 26th through the 27th. And as previously mentioned, uh, I'll be working on getting it live streamed if they're not. And uh, we'll be working on getting all that material for you. As you notice, Daniel Rogers is going to be there, uh, myself and a host of other speakers, including Jonathan Buttrey, Scott Laughlin, Reese Maggard, and Alvin Dixon. Uh, 
I'm familiar with some of those names, not so familiar with some of the others. I want to encourage everybody to write down the dates, on March 26th through 27th. I know they've been sharing hotel information and restaurant information for those that will be visiting uh, with them during that date. Uh, also, well, and lastly, as my voice is starting to go out, um, here on the Preterist Power Hour, we put together a little bit of a format for the next couple of weeks. Uh, this week, as Edward already alluded to, and I'm sure we're excited for, uh, we're going to enter in on the topic of the second exodus. And uh, we're going to have Daniel Rogers joining with us. We're going to have uh, prayerfully uh, still working on uh, having uh, Robert Cruikshank Jr. joining with us, uh, among others. So uh, that's something that uh, we'll be having very soon. Uh, so again, but there will be no Monday morning program. So we'll begin that program at 9 p.m. Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, that is with Daniel Rogers as our guest. Then we're also working toward a leadership vision strategy uh, plan of discussions for the full week of uh, January 31st, starting on January 31st. Uh, January 31st for us, the Power of Preterism Network will be our board meeting. So we're gonna have our annual meeting uh, where we're gonna uh, do some thinking and strategizing for the goal of our ministries. Uh, we have a couple ministries. If you visit powerofpreterism.com, there's a little bit of information there currently being renovated. Um, and we expect some great developments from that. But then what we're going to do following our board meeting is going to have just a week of discussion with uh, leaders of the Power of Preterism Network, board members here, as well as elders and deacons here from the Blue Point Bible Church. So that should be a very encouraging week uh, as we move forward in some of the things that we're planning. And then and obviously asking every leader about their thoughts on preterism. So that should be interesting. Uh, clarity, healing, and strategy. Uh, then uh, this coming Sunday, I want to encourage everyone to gather with a local church. Uh, there's what we're working on as a resource for people to, uh, you know, we, that we would recommend people to be able to be edified throughout the weekend. So uh, what we're going to do is look for resources, preterist and otherwise. Uh, and we're going to put together a link for live services uh, that you could either go to in person or watch online. Uh, and then, of course, YouTube channels and websites for you to get connected to a local congregation near you and uh, or one for your best edification. And I want to say, from my personal opinion, online is great, but I believe gathering in person is important because as we're doing here, we're about to end an hour and a half of talking. There's only so much we can do online. And then we need to you know, spend some time talking together in person. So uh, that being said, our final announcement would be for regarding the Preterist Power Hour is we've planned, we're planning a discussion for preterism and the beginning, meaning the book of Genesis uh, for February 14th. We're going to start that Monday and we're going to move through that week with different guests, topics, etc., resources regarding the uh, preterism and Genesis. So uh, that's my announcements. Edward, I don't know if you think there's anything I might have missed that I need to bring up. That's what I got for us. No, that's what you had outlined with me. So I can't think of anything in addition. All right, cool. All right. And obviously, we mentioned two possible uh, efforts that we're going to work toward, uh, maybe getting Dallas Burdett to join with us in the near future, and hopefully planning something regarding death and the afterlife and the preterist view. So uh, that's what we're working on. I'll unmute the mics. Uh, if you guys have anything you want to bring up, I know Zach and Richard are here with us uh, in regards to our uh, things we brought up on today's program, the topics with the Sean Griffin program, resources, or if you have any flashback or flash forward resources or announcements you'd like to share with us, please go ahead. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> if uh, Zach morning. wants to say something, I'm gonna make this quick because I came in very late, as you saw. I had the opportunity to uh, be on the phone with the uh, uh, Sunlight Broadcasting Network today while they were live on the air. So I, I wasn't gonna budge, let me tell you. you know? uh, so I had an opportunity to say a couple of things there, which, uh, I think is going to change a little bit of the dialogue there. I don't know, but um, so I, I, that's I just want to explain why I was late, and I'll I, so I didn't hear much. So I'm just going to shut up and let Zach say something if you'd like. All right, hey, well, thanks for being here, Richard. Thank you for uh, the opportunity you had and <laughs> making the time to be here with us at the conclusion. Um, hey, Michael, I I have a question. Uh, I know it's kind of late, but. Um, and this may be on, beyond the bounds of what we're able to talk about, but in Jeremiah and Hebrews, there's the reference to the law being written uh, on the hearts of believers under the new covenant. And I've heard that 
interpreted in a number of ways. Um, on one extreme, I guess, is the idea that it's the referent of the law in that in those passages is the Mosaic law. So in some sense, under the new covenant, we're going to have the Mosaic law written on our hearts. And then there's a, on the other extreme, I, you know, especially in a modern American context, you have a lot of people um, appealing to their own hearts in saying, you know, being able to justify just about every anything as long as they feel that it's okay. Um, do you have an idea of what the nature of the law, and I believe it's it's Torah in the in the Hebrew. What what's the nature of the law that's being referred to, and in those two uh, scripture passages, and also what what would be the practical application uh, of those of this idea of the law being written on the heart, or believers in the age of fulfillment amen i appreciate that now there, there are different answers for that within preterism uh as i recently learned uh, in my debate with steve Baisden, uh, they seem to have a little bit different of an understanding of what that means for the law to be written on the heart of his people etc that being said uh in my estimation what we're talking about here is the the old covenant of the letter right and, and we talked about in previous programs talking about the mark of the beast where uh, the people would go about creating, you know, uh, the, the phylacteries, et cetera. Uh, that was their way of inscribing the law on their mind, you know, in their mind and in their hands, so to speak. Um, so there was ways that obviously different Jews interpreted uh, the law being written on your mind and in your hand and, you know, and all of that. So that being said, uh, what we do know as we go through the prophetic literature, the point of the prophetic literature is that they're not following the law of Moses. That when obviously by the time of the first century, we know in their effort to, to do their best for following the law of Moses, they began to create traditions. So now once we understand that sort of narrative, we, I think in my estimation, that helps us understand what's going on in the prophets. For example, in Jeremiah 31, what's the problem? Well, these people have not followed the law of God. They find themselves being brought into Babylonian captivity. And then the Lord is going to do a work where he's going to cause them to walk in the law. He's going to cause them to, you know, that, that in their, the, the, the phrase, having my law written on your minds and on your hearts, uh, is that they're going to walk in obedience to it. So he's going to do something to cause his people to walk in obedience. He's going to provide something, if you will, uh, for his people to walk in obedience. And in my estimation, when we get to Hebrews, that's what's happening, right? It's, it's the, they're explaining how uh, that Christ and the new covenant and the promise of the new covenant is ultimately the law being written on the people's minds and on their hearts. Now, another text I would bring into that discussion would be 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5, which I believe is the Apostle Paul outlining a very similar discussion of the, the, the old being the letter of the tablets and you know being written on stones and how the new is being put on the minds and hearts of his people. And he leans into that discussion a bit in regards to the heart and the mind in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So uh, that would be the way I would understand that. Now, there was part, another part of the, uh, the abuse of that that you brought up was uh, when, so now we seem as though we have no law. And, uh, you know, many people, as you said, you know, they just seem to have this internal inclination as their excuse to be able to do whatever they'd like. Um, I think we need to be careful with that and we need to understand the old covenant and the, you know, again, the point of the old covenant was to point the people of God toward holiness being set apart and maturity and, and many other details that apply to all of life. Now, do I believe we need to follow the letter of the law? No, uh, I think that's the point of the liberty being provided in the new covenant. However, it's not to provide that. That's what you know the apostle Paul leans in on. Should we, uh, you know, then are we do are we permitted to sin? You know, is that is that should we say everything is permissible? No, by no means. So that's how I create a balance there. I, I do. I had somebody approach me this past Sunday after preaching through Galatians and asked me a little bit about, you know, how would I, uh, what outline would I provide for believers? Uh, and I believe that the New Testament actually provides a very um, liberal understanding, if you will, uh, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, where there's a lot of application for the individual to have a conscience of their own. 
So obviously there's a way that we teach children, there's a way that individuals as adults uh, begin to process information. So uh, that being said, I hope that provided some clarity, uh, but I apply just in a very nutshell manner, I apply Jeremiah 31 and uh, what we're reading there in uh, Hebrews and also 2 Corinthians 3 through 5 as details regarding the transition of the covenant. And that's what I believe is going on in Jeremiah 31 and I think it's Hebrews 8. May I share on that topic? Sure. Okay, I have here, you know, I have written down my thoughts. Uh, set your mind on things above. Forget those things that are behind. So you don't want to, you know, return to the law when Jesus is, you know, come with the grace because he says the uh, Jesus two commandments on which all the other laws hang on, you know, which is to love your God with all your mind, hearts, you know, and everything and, and uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, and all the other, you know, commandments hang on that. So that's what I have to say in that regard. Amen. Zach, did we respond? Did I respond? Did Edward respond? Did you feel we sufficiently responded to your question? Uh, yes, but I think it would make a good topic for um, one of these weeks of the Preterist Power Hour. Sure. Amen. Hey, that, amen. I can definitely uh, agree with that. How would you, if you don't mind me asking, uh, how would you want to frame that discussion? What would you think would be like a good uh, topic or like a highlight for that discussion to continue? Like well, I, well, uh, well I, I haven't necessarily worked it all out, but I do think a, a an important thing that I think just the preterist movement in general needs to move towards is the practical application of these concepts and principles that we're outlining. Um, I think a big one of those, a big something, something that has often been overlooked is the, the role of wisdom in the new covenant. Um, and so I, I would probably like to frame it in the context of wisdom and what does that mean uh, for the believer in the new covenant and in an age of fulfillment. Um, and I think a lot of like the issues of what, what the law being on the, or instruction of God being written on the heart is sort of getting at, um, has a lot to do with wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, and the exercise of wisdom in the context of the, of an age of fulfillment. Amen. So do, do I get you right? What you what you would like to discuss is the topic of what um, what it means for the Lord to be written on the heart and how mm -hmm. to practically apply, you know, life's walk, like, you know, how was how we're to live yeah. yes. you know, things of this nature. OK. Yeah, amen. I think that's a beautiful topic. I already have, uh, like I mentioned, uh, somebody that was on Sunday asking me questions they'd love to lean in on that discussion as well. So um, that, thank you, Zach, and I appreciate it. We definitely will table that for uh, some talk there. And um, I appreciate the exhortation to even look into it a bit myself, you know, so. A quick, a quick comment? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I wasn't gonna say any more, but uh, I love this subject that, he, that Zach brought up. Um, you know, I had an atheist say to me one time, he said, if you need a book uh, to tell you not to steal, there's something wrong with you, you know? He said, if you need a book to tell you not to murder somebody, there's something wrong with you. He said, what bothers me about Christianity is they say they don't do these things because it's written. And, and you know, because the Bible says, and the Bible says, and I'm saying if they needed the Bible to tell them that, there was something wrong with them, you know? And I think this is what the Bible really is saying, is that we have to operate from a good conscience. And this is mentioned in scripture. And it's also mentioned when somebody has a conflict of conscience, don't push them. You know, we talk about eating uh, something sacrificed to idols. You know, he said, because if that person believes it's wrong, for them, it is because their conscience isn't clear. And Amen. don't play with that. You know what I mean? Don't, don't try to bypass, force your growth on somebody else. Be patient okay. with them and, deal, and don't go and eat with, you know, in, a, in the restaurant that serves... Thank God we don't have to worry about that anymore, you know, 
uh, what restaurant serves meat sacrificed to idols, you know. But uh, anyhow, that's all I wanted to say about that issue. It's, uh, it's, a, it's you know, that's it. I appreciate that, Richard. And again, I, I'm, I'm happy to table that discussion because uh, it is a conversation I myself like as well. I think that uh, I'd love to hear the different ways people approach it. And uh, it's sort of like another discussion that I'm hoping to table that I think is exhaustive is the discussion about the afterlife and what we're saying about heaven as preterists. I think there's quite a few different inroads and people that have thought that lean in on that discussion. Sometimes it might seem like we're contradicting each other. So uh, I'd love to kind of bring the thoughts together and say, uh, let's see what we uh, end up with. So um, I I'd be excited. And my last thoughts, after, you know, when I, after you give, finish your thought, can I give my last thought? Well, the good news is my thoughts are done, brother. Okay, my last thought is, okay, um, with Moses and his people being, rather before Moses uh, delivered the people out of Egypt, when they were in Egypt, what, 400 years? Um, God gave them a law to, um, to instruct them away from their idolatrous uh, nation in which they were in captivity. So today, okay, like, okay, um, when, when we talk about teaching people, you know, instructions or not to kill stuff like that, people have all kinds of various concepts. Like some people may think, you know, well, you know, the strong should uh, uh, um, abuse the weaker, you know, just how animals do, how animals, uh, feed on the on the weaker animal and stuff like that some people have concepts like that so some some people do need instruction you know because people have all kinds of thoughts you know you you know most not everyone has moral standards you know some people have all kinds of strange ideas you know that because they're left with their own um their own uh, imaginations, which leads them into all kinds of crazy stuff, because people get high on kinds on all kinds of things too. That leads them into all kind of crazy thoughts, or some people just have crazy thoughts because they don't have a foundation in Jesus Christ. You know, so huh? <laughs> I said because they're crazy. Some people have crazy thoughts because they're crazy. So yeah, I, yeah. So yeah. and I agree. I think again, that's a fun conversation to have at another time. Yes. So, you know, uh, Zach, thanks for bringing it up. That's a, again, amazing topic. And that being said, uh, as we close out in a word of prayer this morning, uh, I myself have spiritual disciplines I've put in effect that I believe uh, help usher in uh, the fruits of the spirit and things that make me effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. And one of those has been uh, the month of January, I've marked out uh, the wisdom challenge. Zach mentioned it and I said, oh, great opportunity to bring it up. Uh, the wisdom challenge, which is a reading through the book of Proverbs every day uh, of January. Again, 31 days, 31 chapters. Why not take the opportunity each day to lean in a bit into the wisdom uh, that we read in the book of Proverbs? Now, as many of you know that have read the book of Proverbs, when we read through each of these verses, uh, you'll notice that uh, there's different things that come to mind for each of us. That's the beauty of wisdom. It applies in many different ways. That's why I appreciate what Richard brought up there. First uh, Timothy chapter one, verse five, the goal of our faith is this, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So I pray as we're closing out today, I'm gonna to use Proverbs chapter 14 uh, as our closing prayer. And I just pray ahead of time that the Lord would uh, give each of us love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith through everything that we understand and everything that, especially as we close out in the word of prayer, that we hear here from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14 in closing prayer. I thank each of you, of course, for being here this morning. And I pray that God's word in our time together continues to do its work of edification in your life. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears her down. Whoever fears the Lord walks uprightly, but those who despise him are devious in their ways. A fool's mouth lashes out with pride, but the lips of the wise protect them. Where there are, are no oxen, the, manager is, the manger is empty. But from the strength of an ox comes abundant for harvest. An honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. A mocker seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. Stay away from a fool, for you will not find knowledge on their lips. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways 
that the folly of fools is deception. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but the goodwill is found among the upright. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to death. Even in laughter the heart may ache, and rejoicing may end in grief. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways, the good rewarded for theirs. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. A quick-tempered person does no foolish things. A quick-tempered person does foolish things, excuse me. And the one who devises evil schemes is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Evil doers will bow down in the presence of God and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. It is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Do not those who plot evil go astray, but those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. All hard work brings to profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. The wealth of the wise is their crown, but the folly of fools yields folly. A truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. A large population is a king's glory, but without subjects, a prince is ruined. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. When calamity comes, the wicked are brought down, but even in death, the righteous seek refuge in God. Wisdom reposes in the heart of the discerning, and even among fools, she lets herself be known. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. A king delights in a wise servant, but a shameful servant arouses his fury. I thank you all for your time again. Uh, go in peace, and we'll be here Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern with Daniel Rogers talking about the second exodus. Go in peace. That's nice.